Hello, welcome to Classic Books with Ostara. And tonight we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to be reading a few tales from the Grimm's Fairy Tales. And let me just get into the first one. Right. The first tale is The Frog Prince. Long ago, when wishes often came true, there lived a king whose daughters were all handsome. But the youngest was so beautiful that the son himself, who has seen everything, was bemused every time he shone over her because of her beauty. Near the royal castle there was a great dark wood, and in the wood under an old linden tree was a well. And when the day was hot, the king's daughter used to go forth into the wood and sit by the brink of the cool well. And if the time seemed long, she would take out a golden ball and throw it up and catch it again. And this was her favorite pastime. Now it happened one day that the golden ball, instead of falling back into the maiden's little hand, which had sent it aloft, dropped to the ground near the edge of the well and rolled in. The king's daughter followed it with her eyes as it sank. But the well was deep, so deep that the bottom could not be seen. Then she began to weep. And she wept and wept as if she could never be comforted. And in the midst of her weeping, she heard a voice saying to her, What ails you, king's daughter? Your tear tears would melt a heart of stone. And when she looked to see where the voice came from, there was nothing but a frog stretching his thick, ugly head out of the water. Or is it you, old waddler, she said, I weep because my golden ball has fallen into the well. Never mind, do not weep, answered the frog. I can help you, but what will you give me if I fetch you, fetch up your ball again? Whatever you like, my dear frog, said she. Any of my clothes, my pearls and jewels, or even the golden crown that I wear. Your, your clothes, your pearls and jewels, and your golden crown are not for me, answered the frog. But if you would love me and have me for your companion and playfellow and let me sit by you at table and eat from your plate and drink from your cup and sleep in your little bed, if you promise all this, then would I die below the water and fetch you your golden ball again? Oh, yes, she answered. I'll promise it all. Whatever you want, if you will only get me my ball again. But she thought to herself, what nonsense he talks, as if he could do anything but sit in the water and croak with the other frogs, or could possibly be anyone's companion. But the frog, as soon as he heard her promise, drew his head under the water and sank down out of sight. But after a while he came to the surface again with the ball in his mouth, and he threw it on the grass. The king's daughter was overjoyed to see her pretty plaything again, and she caught it up and ran off with it. Stop, stop, cried the frog. Take me up, too. I cannot run as fast as you. But it was of no use for croak, croak. After her, as he might, she would not listen to him, but made haste home, and very soon forgot about all about the poor frog, who had to betake himself to his well again. The next day, when the king's daughter was sitting at table with the king and all the court and eating from her golden plate, there came something pitter-patter up the marble stairs, and then there came a knocking at the door and a voice crying, Youngest king's daughter, let me in. And she got up and ran to see who it could be. But when she opened the door, there was the frog sitting outside. Then she shut the door hastily and went back to her seat, feeling very uneasy. The king noticed how quick, quickly her heart was beating, and said, My child, what are you afraid of? Is there a giant standing at the door ready to carry you away? Oh, no, answered she. No giant, but a horrid frog. And what does the frog want? asked the king. Oh, dear father, answered the, she. When I was sitting by the well yesterday and playing with my golden ball, it fell into the water. And while I was crying for the loss of it, the frog came and got it again from me on condition 
I would let him be my companion. But I never thought that he could leave the water and come after me. But now there he is outside the door, and he wants to come in to me. And then they all heard him knocking the second time and crying, Youngest king's daughter, open to me by the well water. What promised you me? Youngest king's daughter now open to me. That which thou hast promised must thou perform, said the king. So go now and let him in. So she went and opened the door, and the frog hopped in, following at her heels till she reached her chair. Then he stopped and cried, Lift me up to see by you, sit by you. But she delayed doing so until the king ordered her. When once the frog was on the chair, he wanted to get on the table. And there he sat and sat and said, Now push your golden plate a little nearer so that we may eat together. And so she did. But everybody might see how unwilling she was. And the frog feasted heartily. But every morsel seemed to stick in her throat. I have had enough, said the frog at last. And as I am tired, you must carry me to your room and make ready your silken bed and we will lie down and go to sleep. Then the king's daughter began to weep and was afraid of the cold frog. Then nothing would satisfy him, but he must sleep in her pretty clean bed. Now the king grew angry with her, saying, That which thou hast promised in thy time of necessity must thou now perform. So she picked up the frog with her finger and thumb, carried him upstairs and put him in a corner. And when she had lain down to sleep, he came creeping up, saying, I am tired and want to sleep as much as you. Take me up or I'll tell your father. Then she felt beside him herself with rage, and picking him up, she threw him with all her strength against the wall, crying, Now will you be quiet, you horrid frog? But as he fell, he ceased to be a frog and became all at once a prince with beautiful kind eyes. And it came to pass that, with her father's consent, they became bride and bridegroom. And he told her how a wicked witch had bound him by her spells, and how no one but she alone could have released him, and that they too would go together to his father's kingdom. And there came to the door a carriage drawn by eight white horses, with white plumes on their heads, and with golden har harness. And behind the carriage was standing Faithful Henry, the servant of the young prince. Now Faithful Henry had suffered much such care and pain when his master was turned into a frog that he had been obliged to wear three iron bands over his heart to keep it from breaking with trouble and anxiety. When the carriage started to take the prince to his kingdom and Faithful Henry had helped them both in, he got up behind and was full of joy at his master's deliverance. And when they had gone a part of the way, the prince heard a sound at the back of the carriage, as if something had broken. And he turned round and cried, Henry, the wheel must be breaking. But Henry answered, The wheel does not break. Tis the band round my heart. That's a lesson it's ache. When I grieved for your sake, I bound round my heart. Again and yet once again, there was the same sound. And the prince thought it must be the wheel breaking but it was the breaking of the bands from faithful Henry's heart because he was so relieved and happy. And the next tale in Grimm's Fairy Tales, The Gallant Tailor. One summer morning, a little tailor was sitting on his board near the window and working cheerfully with all his might when an old woman came down the street crying, good jelly to sell, good jelly to sell. The cry sounded pleasant in the little tailor's ears, so he put his head out of the window and called out, Here, my good woman, woman, come here if you want a customer. So the poor woman climbed the steps with her heavy basket and was obliged to unpack and display all her pots to the tailor. He looked at every one of them and, lifting all the lids, applied his nose to each and said at last, the jelly seems pretty good. You may weigh me out four half ounces, or I don't mind having a quarter of a pound. 
The woman who had expected to find a good customer gave him what he asked for, but went off angry and grumbling. This jelly is the very thing for me, cried the little tailor. It will give me strength and cunning. And he took down the bread from the cupboard, cut a whole round of the loaf, and spread the jelly on it, laid it near him, and went out stitching more gallantly than ever. All the while, the scent of the sweet jelly was spreading throughout the room, where there were quantities of flies who were attracted by it and flew to partake. Now then, who asked you to come, said the tailor, and drove the unbidden guests away? But the flies, not understanding his language, were not to be got rid of like that, and returned in larger numbers than before. Then the tailor, not being able to stand it any longer, took from his chimney corner a ragged cloth, and saying, Now I'll let you have it, beat it among them unmercifully. When he ceased and counted the slain, he found seven lying dead before him. This is indeed somewhat, he said, wondering at his own gallantry. The whole town shall know this. So he hastened to cut out a belt, and he stitched it and put on it in large capitals, seven at one blow. The town, did I say, said the little tailor. The whole world shall know it. And his heart quivered with joy like a lamb's tail. The tail tailor fastened the belt round him and began to think of going out into the world, for his workshop seemed as too small for his wor worship. So he looked about in all the houses for something that would be useful to take with him. But he found nothing but an old cheese which he put in his pocket. Outside the door he noticed that a bird had caught in the bush got caught in the bushes. So he took that and put it in his pocket with the cheese. Then he sat out gallantly on his way, and and as he was light and active he felt no fatigue. The way led over a mountain, and when he reached the topmost peak he saw a terrible giant sitting there, and looking about him at his ease. The tailor went bravely up to him, called out to him, and said, Comrade, good day. There you sit, looking over the wide world. I am on the way thither to seek my fortune. Have you a fancy to go with me? The giant looked at the tailor contemptuously and said, You little rascal, you miserable fellow. That may be, answered the little tailor, and undoing his coat, he showed the giant his belt. You can read there whether I am a man or not. The giant read seven at one blow, and thinking it meant men that the tailor had killed, felt at once more respect for the little fellow. But as he wanted to prove him, he took up a stone and squeezed it so hard that wa water came out of it. Now you can do that, said the giant, that is, if you have the strength for it. That's not much, said the little tailor. I call that play. And he put his hand in his pocket and took out the cheese and squeezed it, so that the way ran out of it. Well, said he, what do you think of that? The giant did not know what to say to it, for he could not have believed it of the little man. Then the giant took up a stone and threw it so high that it was nearly out of sight. Now, little fellow, suppose you do that. Well thrown, said the tailor. But the stone fell back to earth again. I will throw you one that will never come back. So he felt in his pocket, took out the bird, and threw it into the air. And the bird, when it found itself at liberty, took wing, flew off, and returned no more. What do you think of that, comrade? asked the tailor. There is no doubt that you can throw, said the giant, but we will see if you can carry. He led the little tailor to a mighty oak tree which had been felled and was lying on the ground and said, Now if you are strong enough, help me to carry this tree out of the wood. Willingly, answered the little man, you take the trunk on your shoulders, I will take the branches with all their foliage. That is much the most difficult. So the giant took the trunk on his shoulders, and the tailor seated himself on a branch, and the giant, who could not see what he was doing, had the whole tree to carry, and the little man on it as well. And the little man was very cheerful and merry, and whistled the tune. 
There were three tailors riding by, as if carrying the tree was mere child's play. The giant, when he had struggled on under his heavy load a part of the way, was tired out and cried, Look here, I must let go that go the tree. The tailor jumped off quickly, and taking hold of the tree with both arms, as if he were carrying it, said the giant, You see, you can't carry the tree, though you are such a big fellow. They went on together a little farther, and, pres and presently they came to a cherry tree, and the giant took hold of the topmost branches, where the ri ripest fruit hung, and pulling them downwards, gave them to the tailor to hold bidding him eat. But the little tailor was much too weak to hold the tree, and as the giant let you let go, the tree sprang back, and the tailor was caught up into the air, and when he dropped down again without any damage, the giant said to him, How is this? Haven't you strength enough to hold such a weak sprig as that? It is not strength that is lacking, answered the little tailor. How should it be to one who has slain seven at one blow? I just jumped over the tree because the hunters are shooting down there in the bushes. You jump it too if you can. The giant made the attempt. Not being able to bolt the tree, he remained hanging in the branches, so that once more the little tailor got the better of him. Then said the giant, As you are such a gallant fellow, suppose you come with me to our den and stay the night. The tailor was quite willing, and he followed him. When they reached the den, there sat some other giants by the fire, and each had a roasted sheep in his hand, and was eating it. The little tailor looked round and thought, There's more elbow room here than in my workshop. And the giant showed him a bed and told him he had better lie down upon it and go to sleep. The bed was, however, too big for the tailor, so he did not stay in it, but crept into a corner to sleep. As soon as it was, it was midnight, the giant got up, took a great staff of iron, and beat the bed through with one stroke, and supposed he had made an end of that grass supper of a tailor. Very early in the morning, the giants went into the wood, forgot, forgot all about the little tailor. When they saw him coming after them alive and merry, they were terribly frightened. And thinking he was going to kill them, they ran away in all haste. So the little tailor marched on, always following his nose. And after he had gone a great way, he entered the courtyard belonging to a king's palace. And there he felt so overpowered with fatigue that he lay down and fell asleep. In the meanwhile came various people who looked at him very curiously and read on his belt, seven at one blow. Oh, and they said, why should this great lord come here in time of peace? What a mighty champion he must be. Then they went and told the king about him, and they thought if war should break out, what a worthy and useful man he would be, and that he ought not to be allowed to depart at any price. The king then summoned his council and sent out one of his courtiers to the little tailor to beg him as soon as he should wake up to consent to serve in the king's army. So the messenger stood and waited at the sleeper's side until his limbs began to stretch and his eyes to open, and then he carried his answer back, and the answer was, that was the reason for which I came, I am ready to enter the king's service. So he was received into it very honorably, and a separate dwelling set apart for him. But the rest of the soldiers were very much set against the little tailor, and they wished him a thousand miles away. What shall be done about it, they said among themselves. If we pick a quarrel and fight with him, then seven of us will fall at each blow. That will be of no good to us. So they came to a resolution went all together to the king to ask for their discharge. We never intended, said they, to serve with a man who kills seven at a blow. The king felt sorry to lose all his faithful servants because of one man, and he wished that if he had never that he had never seen him, and willingly get, would willingly get rid of him if he might. But he did not dare to dismiss the little tailor, for fear he should kill all the king's people and place him upon the throne, himself upon the throne. He thought a long while about it, and at last made up his mind what to do. He sent for the little tailor and told him that, as he was so great a warrior, he had a proposal to make to him. He told him that in a wood in his dominion dwelt two 
giants who did great damage by robbery, murder, and fire, and that no man durst go near them for fear of his life, but that if the tailor should overcome and slay both these giants, the king would give him his only daughter in marriage, and half his kingdom as dowry, and that a hundred horsemen should go with him to give him assistance. That would be something for a man like me, thought the little tailor. A beautiful princess and half a kingdom are not to be had every day. And he said to the king, Oh, yes, I can soon overcome the giants, and yet have no need of the hundred horsemen. He who can kill seven at one blow has no need to be afraid of two. So the little tailor set out, and the hundred horsemen followed him. When he came to the border of the wood, he said to his escort, Stay here while I get to attack the giants. Then he sprang into the wood and looked about him right and left. After a while, he caught sight of the two giants. They were lying down under a tree asleep and snoring so that all the branches shook. The little tailor, all alive, filled both his pockets with stones and climbed up into the tree and made his way to an overhanging bough so that he could seat himself just above the sleepers. And from there he let one stone after another fall on the chest of one of the giants. For a long time the giant was quite unaware of this. But at last he waked up and pushed his comrade and said, What are you hitting me for? You are dreaming, said the other. I'm not touching you. And they composed themselves against the sleep. And the tailor let fall a stone on the other giant. What can that be, cried he. What are you casting at me? I am casting nothing at you, answered the first grumbling. They disposed about it for a while, disputed about it for a while. But as they were tired, they gave it up at last, and their eyes closed once more. Then the little tailor began his game anew, picked out a heavier stone, and threw it down with a force upon the first giant's chest. This is too much, cried he, and sprang up like a madman, and struck his companion such a blow that the tree shook above them. The other paid him back with ready coin, and they fought with such fury that they tore up trees by their roots to use for weapons against each other so that at last they both of them lay dead upon the ground, and now the little tailor got down. Another piece of luck, said he, that the tree I was sitting in did not get torn up too, or else I should have had to jump like a squirrel from one tree to another. Then he drew a sword and gave each of the giants a few hacks in the breast, and went back to the horseman and said, The de deed is done. I have made an end of both of them. But it went hard with me in the struggle. They rooted up trees to defend themselves. But it was, it was of no use. They had to do with a man who can kill seven at one blow. Then are you not wounded, asked the horseman. Nothing of the sort, answered the tailor. I have not turned a hair. The horseman still would not believe it and rode into the wood to see. And there they found the giants wallowing in their blood and all about them lying the uprooted trees. The little tailor then claimed the promised boon, but the king repented him of his offer, and he sought again how to rid of himself of the hero. Before you can possess my daughter and the half of my kingdom, said he to the tailor, you must perform another heroic act. In the wood lives a unicorn who does great damage. You must secure him. A unicorn does not strike more terror into me than two giants. Seven at one blow, that is my way, was the tailor's answer. So taking a rope and an axe with him, he, he went out into the wood and told those who were ordered to tend him to wait outside. He had not far to seek. The unicorn soon came out and sprang at him as if he would make an end of him without delay. Softly, softly, said he, most haste, worse speed, and remaining standing, and remained standing until the animal came quite near. Then he sw slipped quietly behind a tree. The unicorn ran with all his might against the tree and struck his horn so deep into the trunk that he could not get it out again, and so was taken. Now I have you, said the tailor, coming out from behind the tree and putting the rope around the unicorn's neck. He took the axe, set free the horn, and when all his party was assembled, he led forth the animal and brought it to the king. The king did not yet wish to give him the promised reward and set him a third task to do. Before the wedding could take place, the tailor was to secure a wild boar which had done a great deal of damage in the wood. 
The huntsmen were to accompany him. All right, said the tailor, this is child's play. But he did not take the huntsmen into the wood, and they were all the better pleased, for the wild boar had many a time before received them in such a way that they had no fancy to disturb him. When the boar caught sight of the tailor, he ran at him with foaming mouth and gleaming tusks to bear him to the ground. But the nimble hero rushed into a chapel, which chanced to be near, and jumped quickly out of a window on the other side. The boar ran after him, and when he got inside, the door shut after him, and there he was imprisoned, for the creature was too big and unwieldy to jump out of the window, too. Then the little tailor called the huntsmen that they might see the prisoner with their own eyes, and then he betook him to the king, who now, whether he liked it or not, was obliged to fulfill his promise and give him his daughter in the half of his kingdom. But if he had not known that the great warrior was only a little tailor, he would have taken it still more to heart. So the wedding was celebrated with great splendor and little joy, and the tailor was made into a king. One night the young queen heard her husband talking in his sleep and saying, Now, boy, make me that waistcoat and patch me those breeches, or lay my yard measure about your shoulders. And so, as she perceived of what low birth her husband was, she went to her father the next morning and told him all, and begged him to set her free from a man who was nothing better than a tailor. The king made her be comforted, saying, Tonight leave your bedroom door open. My guard shall stand outside, and when he is asleep, they shall come in and bind him and carry him off to a ship, and he shall be sent to the other side of the world. So the wife felt consoled. But the king's water-bearer, who had been listening all the while, went to the little tailor and disclosed to him the whole plan. I should, shall put a stop to all this, said he. At night he lay down as usual in bed, and when his wife thought that he was asleep, she got up, opened the door, and lay down again. The little tailor, who only made believe he was asleep, began to murmur plainly, Now, boy, make me that waistcoat, and patch me the, those breeches, or I'll lay my yard measure about your shoulders. I have set, slain seven at one blow, killed two giants, caught a unicorn, and taken a wild boar. And shall I be afraid of those who are standing outside my room door? And when they heard the tailor say this, a great fear seized them. They fled away as if they had been wild hares, and none of them should venture to attack him. And so the little tailor remained a king all his lifetime. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit like, subscribe, comment below, and hit that notification bell. And stay tuned for the next installment of Grimm's Fairy Tales.